months later, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and America found itself at war. A patriot to the core, Betty raised millions for the war bond effort and was a co-founder of the Hollywood Canteen. Betty was very, very proud of the Hollywood Canteen. Of course, it was a lot of work. It was a canteen only for servicemen who were traveling through Hollywood. They had a place to go. They didn't have to pay one cent. Once working in England, we were staying in a hotel, and a very shy man came up to the table and said, oh, excuse me, Miss Davis, I was at the Hollywood canteen, and I spoke to you. And it was as if the clouds had opened and the sun shone through. She made his day. She was so charming with him. During the war, Betty was an inspiration to the women who were left at home with the strong, independent roles she brought to the screen. Audiences, particularly women, were attracted to Betty Davis because she was accessible. Betty Davis had an intensity and an honesty that we wanted for ourselves. Therefore, when she had it, we kept saying, yeah, sister, yeah, she's one of us, as opposed to one of the goddesses on Mount Olympus. I think she impacted acting and women's roles in a big, big way because she ran the gamut. Um, she could play a bitch or she could play a mousy person. She wasn't afraid of any of it. And it was one of her phrases. I think she had an embroidered pillow, said, no guts, no glory. She lived that. But perhaps Betty's greatest talent as an actress was her ability to reach audiences emotionally, as in romantic melodramas like now Voyager. Betty's magical transformation from a lonely spinster to a confident woman in love as Charlotte Vale left audiences sobbing. Now Voyager was an important turning point in Betty Davis's career. Her great effectiveness, I think, was her reserve. Unlike other actresses in melodramas, her lip didn't quiver, she didn't cry, she held back with this incredible reserve and let you cry and let you go through all of the catharsis of the character. Most actresses chew the scenery whenever they can. They cry and they rant and they rave. And Betty Davis didn't. When you thought she was going to chew the scenery, she was very reserved. And then when she had a scene that could be bland when it was done by other people, that's when the fire exploded from her. By 1942, Betty's superstardom had surpassed even her wildest dreams. She was the highest paid woman in America and had received an additional four Academy Award nominations for Best Actress along the way. Now newly married, it seemed that the brass ring that Betty had sought for so long was finally hers. But tragically, on August 23, 1943, Farney collapsed while walking down Hollywood Boulevard. Two days later, he was dead. Betty later revealed to the press that her husband had fallen down a flight of stairs a month earlier. The cause of his death was never clearly established. A widow at 35, Betty was heartbroken. She returned to work, hoping to put Farney's death behind her. Betty brought a vulnerability and charm to her role in Mr. Skeffington on screen that the cast and crew did not witness on the set. Distraught and emotionally unstable, Betty displayed the temperamental personality that became her trademark. She was a perfectionist. Mother would be at the set, ready to go. She knew her lines, and she just wanted to do her work. Um, there were times, though, obviously, when she had a lot of personality problems with either co-stars or with the uh, producers and directors, and uh, that's, that's, that's history. You, know, you can't get away from that. <laughs> Betty was a handful. I mean, you know, she said what she felt and she did what she wanted to do most of the time. And, uh, you know, she was, uh, she was very well respected for that. In 1944, when Betty was 36, William Grant Sherry, seven years her junior, courted her with a passion that knocked her socks off. A third marriage was to a very handsome ex-Marine artist who she had her daughter by. And uh, from the word go, it was a volatile relationship. I mean, she was a hard-working actress. He was at home painting. The couple soon married. And on May 1st, 1947, Betty's dreams of motherhood came true 
with the birth of her daughter, Barbara Davis Sherry, nicknamed BD. Betty was a mother at last. I got a beautiful daughter from one of these awful marriages. So I can, this good out of everything. I couldn't, I couldn't mind an hour of what that was like yeah. for BD. I really couldn't. Yeah. And who knows, I might not ever have had BD. You know, and I think my life right now without children would be a sad and sorry affair. The time following BD's birth was filled with happiness for Betty. Warner gave the new mother time off, and the family returned to their farm in New England. There, Betty played what would be one of her favorite roles, mother and homemaker. It was very, very important for my mother to be a mother and to participate in everything that, um, you know, mothers do. She would go to the school events if she could. Uh, meals were particularly important to my mother in, uh, in preparing the meals and, and being there. And um, she just thought that mothering was, was something that she had to do and she, had, she approached it kind of as a priority in her life. What started as an idyllic time was soon clouded by husband Sherry's increasing abusiveness. I think that the marriage to William Sherry was uh, a disaster from almost from the word go. Well, he was a very jealous, uh, physical man and threatened to uh, beat her. She realized, I think, that she'd married the wrong man. Sherry and Betty's battles at home continued to escalate. Finally, in 1949, she filed for divorce. When we come back, Betty gets the role of her career. <laughs> 